Chapter Twenty One of The Last Egyptian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. The Last Egyptian by L. Frank Baum. Chapter Twenty One lotus eaters and crocodiles if in all the realm of travel there is a voyage that is absolutely ideal it is the trip up the nile the constant change of scene varying with every bend in the river the shifting lights the gentle ripple of the waters the distant songs and shouts of the native boatmen the outlines of the libyan hills by moonlight and the rocky wastes of desert dotted with gorgeous crimson and yellow cacti by day the sunsets that paint the cloudless egyptian skies with entrancing splendor and the silhouettes of donkey and camel trains above the high embankment at twilight these taken in connection with the carefree lotus-eating existence of the voyager leave an impression so vivid and sweet and altogether satisfactory that no other experience in the whole world of travel can compare with or ever efface it from one's memory aneth believed the dragoman's assertion that prince kara had been generous at last and released her from her promise neither winston nor mrs everingham dared vouch for the dragoman's statements but they remained silent while tadros unabashed explained that his master was whimsical and erratic but very kind-hearted and considerate and incapable of wronging any one in any way as for lord roane miss he said confidentially there is no doubt he did an imprudent thing which vexed my master who has a high sense of honour so he frightened my lord to teach him to be more careful in the future but never had he the slightest idea of exposing him to public infamy i assure you kara has told me so himself the dragoman derived much satisfaction from these inventions especially as he noticed how implicitly aneth believed them and how they operated to cheer her spirits and render her content with her novel and delightful surroundings every one on board was devoted to the girl and under the genial influences of the voyage she recovered to an extent her old brightness and vivacity there was no harm now in blushing happily at the love-light in gerald's eyes and her three companions were those she loved best in all the world her recent cares and heartaches seemed all to have been left behind in cairo and she could look forward to many weeks of keen enjoyment she was sorry however that she had misjudged prince kara and promised herself to implore his pardon immediately on her return to cairo gerald and mrs everingham while they did not disabuse aneth's mind were a trifle uneasy at the growing audacity of the dragoman's statements and warned him to be more careful after the girl had regained her health and self-possession they would explain to her the truth of the matter and discredit tadros freely at present they were content to note her bright eyes and the roses creeping back to her cheeks lord roane had wisely decided not to ask questions from what he overheard he understood that kara was now befriending aneth instead of persecuting her and this being the case his own danger was reduced to a minimum he could not understand the egyptian's change of attitude in the least if kara had intended merely to frighten him he had succeeded admirably and roane told himself that the punishment he had already suffered through terror and despair was sufficient to expiate his long-forgotten sin against hatacha but did kara think so that was a question he could not answer but he decided to defer all worries for the present at least gerald winston would have been less than human had he refrained from showing to aneth during these delightful days how dearly he loved her and what happiness her companionship brought to him the moonlit evenings on deck 
were sufficient to inspire the most bashful lover and gerald did not dare waste his golden opportunities if he won aneth at all it must be on this trip and under the spur of mrs everingham's counsel to be bold he soon put his fate to the test and marvelled at his success the girl had suffered too much to trifle with her lover's heart and her consent was readily won it was his intention that they be married while at luxor or oswan there being english churches in both places and ample conveniences for a proper conduct of the ceremony roane was fond of winston and offered no objection to a plan which would ensure aneth's happiness and which seemed to be defective only in its precipitancy the project pleased aneth as much as it delighted her lover in her days of misery when she thought she had lost him forever the full value of gerald's love had been so impressed upon her that she clung to him now realizing that he represented the full measure of her future happiness still she experienced an uneasy sensation that any unnecessary delay might prove dangerous her contract with kara moreover had taught her to face the possibility of a sudden marriage and what was a hateful ordeal then would now become a crown of triumph whenever you like gerald she said i will become your wife i could never wish for other witnesses of my wedding than my dear grandfather and mrs everingham and happiness is such a precious thing and life so uncertain that i have no desire to resist your proposal thank you my dear one he said gravely and i think i prefer luxor to oswan it will be so romantic to be wed in the old theban city where the egyptian princesses once made their home and where they lived and loved will it not it shall be luxor he declared that week was one of never-to-be-forgotten delight even tadros wore a perpetual smile although this method of sweet communion between lovers was all new and amazing to him he felt quite secure now for the first time since kara had asserted his power over the dragoman's destinies and wondered the thing being so easy why he had so long hesitated to break with his arrogant and imperious master as the dahabiyah lazily breasted the languid current of the river tadros idly wondered what kara was doing now and could not forbear a laugh at the thought of the egyptian's anger and perplexity when he had discovered the flight of his proposed victims oh well kara had pitted his cunning against the dragoman's intelligence it was little wonder he was discomfited on the afternoon of the seventh day they steamed slowly past beni hassan their moderate progress being due to the fact that the boat tied up from every sunset to the next sunrise beni hassan was a picturesque village as viewed from the river where its filth and stench were imperceptible and the groups of splendid palms lent a dignity to the place that a closer inspection would prove undeserved aneth seated happily by gerald's side beneath the ample deck awning admired the village greatly and her lover promised to stop there on their return and give her an opportunity of visiting the famous tombs in the nearby hillside at twilight they anchored midway between beni hassan and antino the boat lying motionless a few yards away from the east bank the evenings are delightful in this part of egypt and it was midnight before the passengers aboard the dahabiyah sought their couches tadros indeed being wakeful lay extended upon the stern deck of the steamer long after the others were asleep engaged in thoughtfully gazing at the high bank and indulging in pleasant dreams of future prosperity when he had added winston bay's three thousand pounds to the snug savings he had already accumulated presently a dark object appeared for an instant at the top of the bank and quickly vanished against the black surface below another succeeded it and another tadros scratched his head in perplexity these dark objects seemed to have form yet they were silent as the dead 
he counted a dozen of them altogether and while still pondering upon their appearance being undecided as to whether they were ghosts or jackals his quick ears caught a splash in the water beside the bank they were not jackals that was certain for those ravenous beasts never take to the water neither are ghosts supposed to bathe from where he lay the surface of the river was scarcely a foot distant and leaning well over the stern tadros managed to discover in the dim light several heads bobbing upon the water he ought to have given an immediate alarm but terror rendered him irresolute and before he had time to act it was too late to arouse his fellow-passengers clambering up the bow were half a score of naked arabs their knives held between their glistening teeth their dark eyes roaming fiercely around tadros's first impulse was to fight but just as he was about to rise to his feet a man whom he knew bounded aft and sprang into the little cabin where the women lay asleep it was kara there was no indecision on the part of the dragoman after that he slipped off the deck into the water with the dexterity of a seal sliding from a rock and while a succession of terrified screams and angry shouts bombarded his ears tadros swam silently across the nile toward the opposite shore the water was cold and he shivered as he swam yet the chill was from within rather than from without there are no crocodiles in the nile now but in places there are serpents and shark-like fish that will bite a mouthful of flesh from a swimmer's leg tadros knew of this but did not think of it just then reflected in his mind was kara's dark visage grim and malignant and with certain death facing him aboard the dahabia the dragoman's only impulse was to get as far away from the danger as possible the turmoil on the boat prevented his escape from being immediately noticed and after a long swim that nearly exhausted his strength he reached the west shore and fell panting upon the hard earth slowly regaining his breath he strained his ears to catch any sound that might proceed from the dahabia but now an oppressive silence reigned on the opposite side of the river the lights of the steamer gleamed faintly through the night but the fate of those he had left on board was wrapped in mystery perhaps kara and his band of assassins would murder all except the girl it was possible he would murder her as well anyway the dragoman's connection with the enterprise had come to an abrupt ending a mile or so away was the little town of rhoda with its railroad station tadros started to walk toward it keeping well back from the edge of the bank so that he might not be discovered in case any one pursued him his dejection and dismay at this sudden reversal of fortune were extreme he had lost the last vestige of the jaunty bearing that usually distinguished him with three thousand pounds already earned but irretrievably lost and the knowledge that kara's merciless enmity would pursue him through life the dragoman's condition was indeed deplorable he wondered what he should do now returning to cairo was out of the question he would go back to fedah his old home nephthys and her mother were there and would hide him if kara appeared unexpectedly yes fedah was his only haven at least until he had time to consider his future plans by and by he reached the station at rhoda the village named after the ancient island in the nile opposite cairo a sleepy arab porter was in charge of the place and eyed the dragoman's wet clothing with evident suspicion when questioned he announced that a train would go south at six o'clock in the morning tadros slipped outside the station and found a convenient hiding-place against a neighboring house where the shadows were so deep that he could not be observed here he laid down to rest and await the arrival of the train by daybreak his clothing had dried but he observed with regret that his blue satin vest had been ruined by the river water and that his syrian sash was disgracefully wrinkled next to life itself he loved his splendid costumes so that this dreary discovery did not tend to raise his dampened spirits when the train drew in he boarded it 
and found himself seated in a compartment opposite to lord consinor they stared at each other for a moment and then the viscount emitted a sound that seemed a queer combination of a growl and a laugh it is cara's alter ego he sneered in english pardon me my lord said the dragoman hastily the alliance is dissolved i have even more reason than you to hate the prince indeed returned consinor he is a fiend emanating directly from your english hell declared tadros earnestly i know of no other diabolical place where cara could have been bred one thing is certain however he continued with bitter emphasis i will have vengeance upon him before i die there was no mistaking the venom of the man's rancorous assertion consinor smiled and said it would give me pleasure to share your revenge a sudden thought struck tadros a thought so tremendous in its scope and significance that he was himself astonished and stared blankly into the other's face for a time he rode in silence revolving the idea in his mind and examining its phases with extreme care then he inquired cautiously where are you going my lord to Asiat. i thought you had left cairo long ago so i did i have been to alexandria but found nothing there to amuse me i am now bound for Asiat, and from there i intend travelling to aswan and up to wadi halfa are you in any hurry to reach there not the slightest then leave the train with me at Cousier. i have something to propose that will interest you consinor studied him a moment does this program include our revenge he asked yes very well i will do as you suggest good exclaimed tadros then he leaned over and whispered revenge and a fortune my lord is it not worth while end of chapter twenty one Chapter Twenty Two of the Last Egyptian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. The Last Egyptian by L. Frank Baum. The Dragoman's Inspiration. They left the train at the station opposite Feta, and the Dragoman secured a native to row them in his skiff across the river consinor asked no questions and appeared wholly indifferent as to their destination indeed his life had been so aimless since his disgraceful flight from cairo that he welcomed any diversion that might relieve its dull monotony when they arrived at feta tadros took him secretly to the hut of old nefert the bread-baker which was directly across the street from the dwelling of hadacha now owned by kara the viscount was inclined to resent the filthiness of the hovel wherein he must hide until the dragoman led him to the shade of the opposite archway and explained to him something of the project he had in mind tadros began by relating the royal one's early history emphasizing the fact that old hadacha had been able to support herself and kara without any labor whatever then he told of hadacha's death and how he tadros had discovered the valuable rolls of papyrus in kara's possession from thence to the brilliant advent of the prince in cairo was but a step and the entire history permitted but one explanation the fact that kara had knowledge of an ancient tomb containing great riches once said the dragoman kara and i made a visit to feta but i did not suspect his errand and so neglected to watch him being at the time greatly occupied with a certain maiden in the morning i found he had loaded his travelling cases with treasures wonderful gems that have enabled him to live in princely fashion ever since where did he get them asked consinor eagerly as i said from some hidden tomb the secret of which is known only to himself do you think he has carried all the treasure away i have reason to believe that more remains than has ever been taken once in an unguarded moment kara told me that he could not spend it all in a thousand years do you suppose we can discover this tomb yes if we are clever it is no use to hunt without a clue but kara will furnish us the clue we need in what way the viscount inquired 
he is coming here presently consinor frowned i do not care to meet him he said hastily nor do i rejoined tadros with a shudder but it will not be necessary for us to meet kara who will not suspect we are in the village what then he is coming to secure more treasure his former supply being exhausted as i have reason to know he has promised his tradesmen money and will not dare delay his visit to feta besides he is not far from here at this very moment by to-morrow if he comes in winston bay's dahabia he will reach this place if he decides to take a railway train he may be here this evening in that case what do you propose to do demanded consinor spy upon him discover where the treasure is hidden and when he is gone help ourselves was the confident reply the idea seemed quite feasible when further elaborated they entered the room of kara's dwelling and examined the place carefully this explained the dragoman is doubtless his starting point from here he has either a secret passage into the mountain or he steals away to the desert where the entrance to the tomb is hidden underneath the shifting sands we must be prepared to watch him in either event and that is why i have proposed to you to assist me rather than try to secure all the fortune myself i am assured there is plenty for two and to spare doubtless replied the viscount laconically already he saw visions of great wealth which would enable him to return to london and rise superior to all the sneers and scandals that had been thrust upon him they discussed the matter long and earnestly the few inhabitants of the village stupid and inert being entirely ignorant of their presence it was finally decided that on kara's approach consinor should conceal himself beneath the dried rushes of the old bed tadro so arranging his position that the viscount could observe every action of one moving within the room then the dragoman would himself lurk at the edge of the village to follow kara if he stole the way into the desert as a matter of fact tadros was firm in his belief that the treasure was hidden within the mountain but he had no intention of risking his own life when he could induce consinor to become his cat's paw discovery meant death he knew that well enough it was better not to take chances and if the viscount succeeded in learning kara's secret it would mean the same to tadros as learning it himself he knew how to handle this outcast englishman and if the treasure proved as large as he suspected he could afford to be generous and would play fair with his accomplice otherwise but that could be considered later tadros did not desire to expose the stranger to the curious gaze of the villagers but there was no harm in their knowing that the dragoman had come among his old friends once more so he insisted that consignor should stay concealed in nefert's hovel flying to a dark corner at the sound of every footstep while he himself visited sarah and her daughter in furtherance of his sagacious plans End of the Dragoman's Inspiration Chapter 23 of The Last Egyptian This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Kathleen The Last Egyptian by L. Frank Baum Mother and Daughter As the Dragoman approached, sarah's hut he paused upon the threshold to observe the scene within hesitating he remembered that it was because of his own reckless conduct that the nile girl had been stripped of her beautiful gowns and jewels and sent home from cairo scorned and repudiated her humiliation and despair had haunted him ever since but now he found her seated meekly at the well-worn loom casting the shuttle back and forth with the same mechanical lassitude she had exhibited of old the discolored black dress open at the breast and much patched and torn was her sole garment even the blue beads were again about her neck but the eyes she turned toward tadros were different somehow their former velvety depths were veiled with a dull film while the smoothness of her brow was marred by the wrinkles of a sullen frown after a moment however she seemed to recognize the dragoman and rose from her place with a sudden eager look and flushed cheeks you have come for me again she asked 
no answered tadros casting himself upon a settle he felt abashed without knowing why he should entertain such a feeling abashed and sorrowful in spite of his habitual egoism and selfish disregard of others nephthys leaned back and resumed her weaving the film covered her eyes again she paid no further attention to her mother's guest thera however was voluble and indignant that kara she hissed it is a viper a crocodile a low infamous deceiver he is worse than an arab Himph! if i had him here i would stamp him into the dust why did he spurn my beautiful daughter from his harem tell me then merely because nephthys and i being old friends wish to converse at times of you and our acquaintances at feta why should we not gossip and smoke a cigarette together once i owned her myself true you were a fool to sell her still you must not forget that nephthys has had an experience he resumed more lightly for a time she was a queen splendid and magnificent beyond compare in her robes of satin and her sparkling jewels ah it is not every girl who enjoys such luxury even for a brief season let her be content content screamed old sira shrilly it has ruined her she is no longer happy in the old home and when she speaks which is but seldom it is only to curse kara look at her is she now fat and beautiful as before no if the poor child lives long enough she will die a skeleton allah forbid exclaimed tadros hastily but if she expects to be taken back again her case is hopeless i am sure kara will never relent or restore her to favor he is a poor judge of a woman but i slapping his chest proudly i will take nephthys to myself and while i do not promise to robe her as gorgeously as kara did she shall become fat again and have her silks and ornaments the same as before and the cigarettes of course he drew a box of the coveted cigarettes from his pocket and tossed it toward her sarah lighted one eagerly and gave the box to nephthys after staring at it blankly for a moment the girl seemed to understand she took a cigarette and lighted it from the one her mother was smoking a smile of childish enjoyment slowly spread over her face and she left her loom and came and sat upon tadros's knee i expect kara in feta presently remarked the dragoman but he must not know that i am here we have had a falling out i quarrelled with him and he threatens me never fear said sarah calmly i can hide you in the cavity in the rear wall which the royal one knows nothing of there you will be safe until he goes away very good he replied when will kara come asked the woman and why does he visit feta again i expect him to-night or to-morrow why he comes i do not know perhaps to pray beside at a chismomi where is that he asked quickly i cannot discover she returned often i have examined their dwelling but no secret door can i find anywhere the tomb must be in the hills or perhaps in the desert there is an oasis where the dwarf sebet lives he was known to be one of hatatcha's most devoted followers true said the dragoman thoughtfully the tomb must be in sebet's oasis once kara stole old nico's donkey and rode there was that the last time we came here questioned tadros no it was when hatatcha died then the tomb is not in the oasis i am sure it is quite near feta but listen my sarah if i agree to take nephthys and provide for her you must help me when kara comes i have promised to hide you in the old wall she replied can i do more than that yes you must go at once to the hill and watch for the royal one's coming your eyes are sharp even though you are old he will come from the nile either across the river or from the north on a boat that smokes and has no sails as soon as you discover him you will hurry here to me and that will give us time to prepare for kara will you do this for me may i have the box of cigarettes to take with me yes then i will do your bidding she went away to the hill at once leaving tadros with nephthys but the girl had already forgotten his presence and was staring straight before her with lustreless eyes the dragoman sighed it is very unfortunate he murmured examining her critically but it is doubtless true nevertheless she is getting thin end of mother and daughter chapter twenty four of the last egyptian this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen the last egyptian by l frank baum the sheik demurs 
no one on board the dahabeah had entertained even a suspicion of danger winston bay knew well the unreliable character of the natives of certain villages but even he did not dream that the steamer would be molested or its passengers annoyed therefore the surprise was complete mrs everingham awakening with the start heard the patter of many feet upon the deck and saw a man advancing into the cabin where she and aneth had been sleeping her first inspiration was to scream but instead she reached beneath her pillow and drew out a small revolver with which she fired two shots in rapid succession point-blank at the intruder neither bullet took effect but they startled kara as much as her vigorous screams in which aneth now joined he retreated hastily from the cabin thus allowing mrs everingham to close the door and secure it with a heavy bar provided for that purpose the after cabin having been given up to the women winston and lord roane occupied a smaller cabin forward between the two were the kitchen and the engine-room as the natives boarded the steamer near the bow their first act was to drop into the forward cabin and seize the white men before they were fairly awake roan offered no resistance whatever but winston struggled so energetically that it took three of the men headed by the gigantic sheik to secure him it required but a few moments to bind the prisoners securely hand and foot and then they were left in their bunks under a guard of natives who held their bare knives in their hands in readiness to prevent any possible escape the four arabs of winston's crew were easily overcome and by the time that kara arrived forward they laid upon the deck carefully pinioned there had been no bloodshed at all and the steamer was now entirely in the control of kara and his mercenaries all right said the sheik nodding his satisfaction as the egyptian approached it was very easy my prince the two white men are below and the boat is ours kara by the dim light of a lantern peered into the faces of his prisoners where is the dragoman he asked did you kill him as i commanded you to do we had not that pleasure returned the sheik for he was not on board are you sure very sure my prince he may be in hiding search every part of the steamer thoroughly except the cabin of the women the sheik shrugged his shoulders but gave the command to his men they examined every possible hiding-place without finding the dragoman meanwhile kara squatted upon the deck thinking earnestly of what his future action should be while the silent sheik sat beside him with composed indifference when the arabs returned from their unsuccessful quest the egyptian said to his ally let your men watch the prisoners until morning we can do nothing more at present so they stretched themselves upon the deck and rested until daybreak as soon as it was light enough to distinguish objects readily kara arose and ordered winston and lord roane brought upon deck there they saw the egyptian for the first time and understood why they had been attacked i suspected that i owed this little diversion to you said winston glaring angrily upon his enemy perhaps you do not realize prince kara that by this lawless act you have ruined yourself and your career no returned kara smiling i do not realize that these things are not tolerated in egypt to-day continued the bey not if they are known admitted kara do you think sir that i will remain silent demanded winston indignantly yes and why because i have no intention of permitting you to return to cairo understand me winston bey i entertain no personal enmity toward you but you saw fit to interfere with my purposes and in doing so destroyed yourself having been lawless enough to capture your boat an outrage only justified by my desire to obtain possession of the persons of aneth consinor and lord roane i am compelled in order to protect myself to silence every person aboard who might cause me future annoyance therefore it is necessary to kill you you dare not you misjudge me answered kara coolly but i shall be glad to furnish you immediate proof of my sincerity turning to antar he said comrade oblige me by placing your knife in the heart of winston bay the sheik did not move well cried kara impatiently it is not in the compact returned the imperturbable arab you are wrong said the egyptian sharply it was fully understood you should obey my commands especially as to killing those of my enemies whom i desire to silence my brother will remember returned the sheik that there was also another understanding a little matter relating to certain jewels and piastres you shall have them and you shall be obeyed when i have them 
winston smiled and kara saw it and uttered a curse will you thwart me now when it is too late for either of us to retreat with safety he asked antar angrily by no means i do not object to the killing believe me my brother but my people are poor and the money you have promised them will do much to ease their sufferings let me but see the gems and the piastres and all your desires shall be gratified winston looked at the gigantic arab closely he seemed to remember the man but could not place him for antar had not only trimmed his gray beard but had dyed it a deep black still all natives are crafty and covetous and the words he had overheard gave him an idea listen my sheik he said in arabic if it is money you wish i will double kara's offer to you it is but natural that a man will pay more for life than another will pay for revenge state your price and the sum shall be yours antar turned toward the egyptian an expression of satisfaction upon his keen features my brother will answer he said this is absurd declared kara winston bey but trifles with you his money is all in cairo when you go there to get it he will throw you into prison and your people will be destroyed and their houses torn down to satisfy the government police the noble sheik is no fool observed winston he will keep us in his power closely guarded until he has sent to cairo and obtained the money also i will promise not to betray him and my word is as good as that of prince kara but why should he go to cairo at all asked the egyptian if he will but come with me to fedah he shall have his price not all of winston bey's wealth can approach the magnificence of the treasure i will place in antar's hands the eyes of the sheik sparkled good he exclaimed you will be faithful to me asked kara why not there is much treasure at my command not a mere handful of gems shall be yours but enough to make your tribe wealthy for all time to come i believe that my brother speaks the truth then said kara relieved i ask you to kill winston bey as a proof of your confidence in me the others may live until we get to fedah ta what is the use of dividing the ceremony returned the sheik with a gesture of indifference i like not this pig sticking in sections it means cleaning one's knife several times instead of once be patient my brother when we have arrived at fedah and our friendship is further cemented by your royal generosity then i will accomplish all the killing in a brief space and have done with it is it not so kara hesitated but saw clearly that the wily sheik would not trust him moreover he feared that winston's eager offers to outbid him if persistently repeated might prove effectual unless he carried out his own promises to the greedy arab he had not expected to pay antar any great price for his services and in the beginning intended that the handful of gems would be a very small one but antar had entrapped him cleverly and he now realized he must expend an exorbitant sum to induce the old sheik to obey his orders after all that did not matter the entire treasure had been hatatches before it descended to him and a portion of it would be well expended in securing her vengeance he alone knew that the hoard was practically inexhaustible and he might even bury the big arab in jewels and golden ornaments and still have left more than he could use in his own lifetime so he agreed with assumed content to antar's proposition and abdallah the engineer was released from his bonds and instructed to start the dahabia upon its voyage up the river it would be thirty hours before they could hope to reach fedah roan and winston were permitted to remain upon deck but were tied to their chairs and carefully guarded breakfast was served and kara accompanied the arab who carried the tray to the cabin of the women the egyptian had not disturbed them since the night before well knowing they had made themselves as secure as he could have done he rapped boldly upon the door and said let me in who is it asked mrs everingham prince kara by what right do you annoy us with your presence aboard this boat she continued that i will explain when you permit me to see you he answered for a few moments there was silence your breakfast is here and the servant is waiting for you to open the door continued kara somewhat to his surprise the bar was removed and annette threw the door wide open one moment please cried mrs everingham and as kara was about to enter he saw the lady standing in the middle of the cabin with her revolver pointed toward him i was so startled last night that i missed you she said calmly but i am almost certain i can shoot straight this morning kara shrank back a little why do you fear me he asked i don't she answered 
it is you who fear and with reason but i do not trust you because you have convinced me that you are a consummate scoundrel if you have anything to say to me or miss consinor we are prepared to hear it otherwise you had better go for i am extremely nervous and my finger is upon the trigger i have taken possession of this steamer he announced all on board are now my prisoners how dramatic she returned with a laugh may i ask what you intend to do with us will you scuttle the ship or raise the black flag and become a modern pirate of the nile come my buccaneer confide to us your secret in due time madam you shall know all and more perhaps than will please you he answered furious at her jibes one thing however is certain miss consinor and here he cast an evil glare at the girl who stood with white face in the background shall not escape me again i intend to take her to cairo and keep her secure in my villa as for you mrs everingham your life hangs by a thread if i could depend upon your discretion and silence i might spare you but you are clever enough to understand that i cannot afford to take chances of future accusations my man replied mrs everingham your own miserable life is at this moment not worth a farthing's purchase if you dare to molest this girl or me again or even show your ugly face in this cabin i swear to shoot you upon the spot here selim bring in that tray place it on the table that will do now prince kara i will give you one minute to disappear that was too long he was gone in an instant his face contorted with rage as he cursed the woman who had so successfully defied him on deck he met the sheik tell the engineer to urge the boat forward he said we must keep moving day and night until we reach gebel abu feta very good responded the sheik i am even more impatient than you are my brother it is only the prisoners who have been watching us sharpen our knives that are in no hurry End of the sheik demurs Chapter twenty five of the last Egyptian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Last Egyptian by L. Frank Baum. Chapter twenty five The Bronze Bolts. Old Sarah kept watch faithfully that day and the next at her post of observation on the hill finding solace through the tedium of the hours in an occasional cigarette from her precious box soon after noon of the second day she hurried to tadros he is coming she said the dragoman sprang up from which direction he inquired from down the river he is in the steamboat and in half an hour will be at the landing go back at once commanded tadros wait until he lands and then come to me immediately i will be in hatatcha's house sarah obeyed and to the dragoman's surprise nephthys followed her mother to the hill the girl had roused herself when the old woman returned and seemed to comprehend from the eager conversation and the dragoman's orders that kara was coming she said nothing however but hastened after her mother and took a position beside her on the height commanding the river tadros ran to the house of hatatcha where consinor having rebelled at the confinement in old nefert's hovel had that morning installed himself it was as safe a refuge as the other for none of the villagers ventured to enter the grim archway and so long as the viscount escaped observation tadros was content there was little cheer in the gloomy room however and consinor had begun to believe that he could scarcely be recompensed for the miserable hours of waiting by the promised reward when to his infinite relief his fellow conspirator entered to announce that the long anticipated time for action had arrived there is not a moment to be lost said tadros get under the rushes quick the viscount immediately burrowed beneath the dry rushes and the dragoman placed him in such a position that his head was elevated slightly and rested against the stones of the wall thus enabling him to observe every corner of the room through the loosely strewn covering having safely concealed him tadros stood back and examined the rushes critically to satisfy himself that kara would have no suspicion that they had been recently disturbed the arrangement was admirable he could not see consinor himself even though he knew he was hidden there are you comfortable he asked not very i mean can you remain quietly in that position for an hour or more yes answered consinor through the rushes then i will go announced tadros be very careful in your actions 
remember that a fortune for both of us hinges upon the events of the next hour and we must make no mistake i go to watch the street and the desert beyond farewell and may fortune attend you he left the house dropping the ragged mat over the inner arch and then crossing to nefert's hut presently sarah came running toward him he has landed and is coming this way she reported very well go home the cigarettes are all gone he tossed her another box and soon she had disappeared within her own doorway nephthys was not with her but tadros had forgotten the girl just then he crept within nefert's front room and hid himself in the shadows in such a way that he could see through the hole which served as a window the opposite arch of hatacha's dwelling kara entered the narrow street and looked cautiously around him it pleased him that no curious native was in sight the sheik and his band were in possession of the dahabia and the prisoners and were awaiting kara's return with impatience therefore he must enter the secret tomb at once without the cover of darkness to shield his movements but the inhabitants of feda were dull and apathetic they were not likely to spy upon him he glanced with pride at the ring he wore upon his finger the talisman of atka ra was indeed powerful for it had enabled him to accomplish all that he desired and was protecting him even now should he take this occasion to restore it to the tomb of his ancestor that ancient one who had entreated that it be left with his mummy for all time and had threatened with dire misfortune any one who dared to remove it why should kara leave the precious stone of fortune in that mountainous dungeon why should he deprive himself of the powers it bestowed upon its possessor it could not now benefit atka ra who was long since forgotten in the netherworld but it might be of service to kara in many ways yes he would keep it despite the pleading and curses of that dead one who so foolishly and selfishly wished it left with his mummy perhaps some day years hence he would restore the stone to the sarcophagus from whence he had taken it but not now again he looked at the strange jewel which seemed of extraordinary brilliancy at that moment shooting its tongues of flame in every direction the curse Henf. Why should he care for the curse of a mummy when the greatest talisman of fortune in the world was his? He slipped within the archway of his dwelling and drew the mat closely behind him. Tadros had marked his every movement and now breathed a sigh of relief. For the present, at all events, the adventure was in Consinor's keeping rather than his own, and Consinor must suffer the risk of detection. The dragoman settled himself upon an earthen bench and kept his eyes on the archway. Presently, Nephthys came stealing into view, treading with the caution of a cat and crouching beneath the stone arch. She did not attempt to draw aside the mat, but squatted upon the ground just outside the barrier. Tadros observed her curiously and noticed that one of her hands was thrust within her bosom as if clutching some weapon. A dagger? Perhaps. Nephthys had been wronged and might be excused for hating Kara. Should the dragoman interfere to save him? To what end? before the girl could strike the royal one's secret would be in consinor's possession and then why nephthys would save them any annoyance their discovery might entail clearly it was not a case that merited interference meantime consinor had noted the entrance of kara as well as the care with which the matting had been fastened to keep out prying eyes it shut out most of the light also but that bothered the egyptian more than it did the englishman whose eyes had now grown accustomed to the dimness kara had to feel his way along the wall to the secret crypt but he knew the location of the place exactly and soon found it consinor saw him take from the recess a slender bronze dagger with a queerly shaped blade and an antique oil lamp with these he approached the opposite wall of the room that which was built against the mountain and pushed vigorously against one of the stones it swung inward the spy saw only blackness beyond but his first consideration was to count the stones from the corner to the opening and then to note that it was in the third tier or layer of masonry by this time kara had crept through and closed the orifice consinor was breathing heavily with excitement the great discovery had been made with ease all he need do was wait until kara came out and left the village and then he would be able to visit the secret tomb and its treasure chamber himself but as the moments slowly passed, moments whose length was exaggerated into seeming hours, Consinor began to feel uneasy. 
he remembered that tadros had impressed upon him the necessity of following kara wherever he went the secret might not be all upon the surface fearful that he had wasted precious time in delay he threw aside the covering of rushes and approached the wall it was scarcely necessary to count the stones he had stared at them so long that he knew the exact spot which kara had touched responsive to his push the great stone again swung backward and he crept through as the other had done and found himself confronted with blackness the dragoman had foreseen such an event and had thoughtfully provided his accomplice with a candle consinor lit it and leaving the stone entrance somewhat ajar so that he might have no trouble in escaping if he were compelled to return in haste he began a cautious exploration of the various passages that led into the mountain he lost some time in pursuing false trails but at length he came upon a burnt match tossed carelessly aside when kara had lighted his lamp and it lay within the entrance of a rough and forbidding-looking gallery between the rocks however consinor followed this trail and after stumbling along blindly until it had nearly ended in a cul-de-sac he came to a circular door in the cliff which stood wide open beyond was a passage carefully built by man into the very heart of the mountain the viscount paused to examine the door carefully it had been most cleverly constructed and fitted its opening accurately six huge bronze bolts working upon springs were ranged along its edge and the single hinge was of enormous size and likewise composed of solid bronze but he could see no keyhole nor lever by means of which the door had been opened the outer surface was an irregular rock harmonizing with the side of the passage but the edges and the inner surface were carefully dressed with chisels an examination of the casing showed bronze sockets for the bolts securely embedded in the cliff and he could understand that when the door was closed the bolts fastened themselves automatically but how had it been opened that was a mystery he could not penetrate for kara after unlocking the door had inadvertently withdrawn the dagger from the secret orifice and carried it with him into the tomb it was a foolhardy proceeding for if by chance he dropped the dagger inside the passage he would forever afterward be powerless to enter the tomb again since it was the only key to the treasure chamber in existence besides the removal of the dagger from the orifice was useless for as hatacha had once explained to kara the door could not be opened from the inside consinor felt convinced that the egyptian must have gone through this passage so he cautiously entered the doorway it was a long straight way slanting downward and before he had proceeded far the atmosphere became dense and stifling still he decided that where kara had gone he could also go and so persevered holding the candle above his head and walking as swiftly as he dared meantime the egyptian had penetrated to the vast mummy chamber where because of his haste he neglected to light any of the bronze lamps depending alone upon the dim illumination which the flickering wick of his small lamp afforded he passed the bodies of hatacha and tai aten with scarcely a glance in their direction and hastened between the rows of mummy cases toward the upper end of the room here majestically imposing stood the great sarcophagus of atka ra its thousand jewels glittering weirdly in the fitful glare of the floating wick as kara held the lamp close to its side to detect the secret spring in the malachite slab that opened the way to the treasure chamber the stone slid back with a sound that seemed like a moan of protest and the egyptian gave a nervous start as for the first time a realization of his dread surroundings flashed upon him but he controlled himself and muttered perhaps it is the ghost of my great ancestor bewailing the loss of his talisman if his spirit could creep back from the far nether world it would doubtless demand of me the return of the stone of fortune not yet atka ra he called aloud mockingly save your curse for a year longer and it will not be required just now i have more need of the talisman than you have with these words he crawled into the aperture and descended the steps to the room below he had brought with him two canvas sacks one of which he proceeded to fill with the poorest and least valuable of the ornaments that littered the place 
even then the tribute to sheik antar was far in excess of the value of his services and kara groaned at the necessity of bribing the crafty arab so heavily the other sack was to contain his own treasure and that he might avoid frequent visits to this gloomy place which he began to dread he selected the rarest of the great gems and the richest golden jewellery for himself tumbling altogether into the receptacle until it was full to overflowing and could only be tied at the neck by shaking down the contents the two sacks were heavy when he picked them up to carry them away he suspended the bronze lamp in front of him by attaching its chain to a button of his gray coat then a burden under either arm he ascended the stairs and stepped from the orifice into the chamber above as he did this the weight of the treasure shifted and he stumbled and fell heavily against the massive sarcophagus of atka ra the jar of the impact was enough to send the golden bust of isis toppling from its place it struck kara in the breast upsetting the lamp and leaving him in total darkness then it rebounded and caught his hand crushing it against the marble side of the tomb the sharp pain caused by this made him cry out and cling faint and ill to the stones of the sarcophagus there motionless he stood in the dark and listened while the bust fell into the opening at his feet and slowly rolled step by step into the treasure chamber beneath finally adding itself with a hollow crash to the rich hoard the ages had accumulated therein kara shuddered the awful incident the blackness that enveloped him the clamor of the noise in that silent place and the quiet suspense succeeding it all conspired to unnerve him and fill his heart with consternation the sacks had fallen from his grasp he raised his injured hand felt it and gave a sudden cry of terror the ring containing his ancestor's precious stone of fortune had been broken by the blow and the talisman was gone gone then the curse had fallen it was upon him even now and perhaps at his side stood the grim spirit of atka ra leering at him through the darkness and exulting in his discomfiture trembling in every limb the egyptian fell upon his knees and began creeping here and there upon the clammy stones his eyes staring into the gloom and his fingers clutching at every slight protuberance in the hope of finding again the wonderful stone that could alone protect him in his extremity the curse was upon him but he would resist its awful power he must resist for if he succumbed now there would be no future escape from his fate the stone he must find the stone somewhere in that vast chamber of death it lay slyly waiting for him to reclaim it the cold indifference that was an integral part of kara's nature had completely deserted him the superstitious fear inherited by him from the centuries had gripped his heart securely and made him its bondman he mumbled incoherently as prone upon all fours he shuffled hither and thither in his vain search the words of warning contained in the tiny parchment the solemn curse of his ancestor upon any who deprived him of the talisman of fortune seemed alone to occupy a mind suddenly rendered witless and unruly by the calamity of the moment the darkness was oppressive there was no sound since the golden bust had bumped its way into the treasure chamber the atmosphere although fed and restored from some hidden conduit seemed stagnant and full of the bituminous stench of the mummies kara drew his quaking body about with an effort feeling that the silence the dead air and the blackness were conspiring to stifle him he found the lamp presently but the oil was spilled and the wick gone it did not occur to him to strike a match if the stone is here he thought i shall see its flaming tongues even through the darkness it cannot escape me i must seek until i find it twice he crept around the colossal sarcophagus of atka ra feeling his way cautiously and glaring into the darkness with distended eyeballs and then came his reward a streak of fire darted before his eyes and vanished another succeeded it he paused and watched intently a faint blue cloud appeared whence the flames radiated sometimes they were crimson then a sulphurous yellow then pure white in color but they always darted fiercely from the central cloud which gradually took form and outlined the irregular oblong of the wonderful stone the radiance positively grew 
the tongues of flame darted swifter and more brilliantly they lighted the surrounding space and brought into relief the glistening end of atka ra's tomb kara stared with an amazement akin to fear for the talisman lay upon the floor just beneath the triple circlet of gold whence he had pried it with his dagger it had not only escaped from its unlawful possessor but had returned to where the ancient egyptian had originally placed it and now it mocked him with its magical brilliance he could have reached out a hand and seized it in his grasp but so great was his horror of the curse of atka ra that his impulse was rather to shrink from the demoniacal gem how wonderful was its brilliance it lighted the sarcophagus and the wall beyond it lighted the floor with a broad streak of yellow light it lighted even kara himself grovelling before it on hands and knees no ordinary gem could do this it was sorcery it was he uttered a scream that echoed horribly through the vault and sprang to his feet for a glance over his shoulder had betrayed the secret of the strange illumination at the lower end of the room stood a man holding above his head a lighted candle he was motionless gazing curiously at the prone form of the egyptian wallowing before a tomb encrusted with precious stones but now he returned kara's scream with a startled cry and turned involuntarily as if to fly when the other sprang up and advanced rapidly toward him down past the rows of silent mummies sped the egyptian while consinor awaited him in a stupor of indecision then finally realizing his danger he dashed the candle to the ground and ran up the passage as fast as he could go kara although once more plunged into darkness by this action knew the way much better than the englishman and did not for an instant hesitate to follow him the curse of atka ra was now forgotten the talisman forgotten kara realized that another had discovered his secret and the safety of the treasure demanded that the intruder should not be permitted to leave the tomb alive consinor on his part was slower to comprehend the situation yet there was no doubt the egyptian meant mischief and the only means of escape lay up the long narrow passage as he fled he collided with the huge pillar that divided the library from the mummy chamber and rebounded against the wall of the gallery falling heavily to the ground in an instant kara was upon him his knee pressing the viscount's breast his slender talon-like fingers twined around his enemy's throat but when it came to wrestling the englishman was no mean antagonist as the native released one hand to search in his bosom for the bronze dagger consinor suddenly grasped him around the middle and easily threw him over reversing their positions his body resting upon and weighing down that of the slighter egyptian failing to find the knife kara again gripped the other's throat with his powerful fingers there was but one thing to do in this desperate emergency consinor raised his enemy's head and dashed it against the stone floor the egyptian's grasp relaxed he lost consciousness and tearing himself from the fatal embrace the viscount rose slowly to his feet his brain reeling his breath gradually returning to him in short gasps for a few moments he leaned against the wall for support then rousing himself to action he tottered slowly along the passage feeling his way by keeping one hand against the wall of rock he had not proceeded far however when a rustling sound warned him that kara had returned to life his ears rendered sensitive by his fearful plight told him that his enemy had risen and he heard the fall of footsteps pursuing him but consinor was already retreating as rapidly as possible impelled to swiftness by the spur of fear proceeding through the intense darkness at times he struck the sides of the rock gallery with a force that nearly knocked him off his feet but in the main it was a smooth and straight way and the egyptian did not seem to gain perceptibly upon him being evidently as dazed by the blow upon his head as was the englishman by the throttling he had endured and so they pressed on panting along through the stifling atmosphere until suddenly consinor ran full against the rocky end of the passage and fell half stunned upon the floor he heard the pattering of kara's footsteps the sound indicating that the egyptian was gradually drawing nearer and dazed as he was realized that sudden death menaced him with a final effort he sprang to his feet tumbled through the circular opening and slammed the door into place with all his remaining strength 
he heard the sharp click of the bolts as they shot into their sockets and the muffled cry of terror from the imprisoned kara thoroughly appalled at what he had done he again rose to his feet and moved rapidly along toward the entrance to the outer corridor for a certain distance the floor of this natural passage was as smooth as that of the artificial one and before he came to the rougher portion consinor saw a dim light ahead that came from the opening in the wall of the room all semblance of composure had now deserted him his cowardice fully manifested itself at his first discovery and he was not sure even now that the bronze bolts shut in his enemy that he was safe from pursuit with Kara's despairing cry still ringing in his ears, he reached the wall, passed through the opening, drew the stone into place behind him as a further precaution, and then sped in a panic across the room. Nephthys heard him coming and thought it was Kara. As he tore down the matting and dashed through the arch, the girl rose to her feet and viciously thrust out her hand. Consinor fell with a moan at her feet, drenching the hard ground with a stream of blood by the time tadros had rushed to his assistance he was dead the dragoman on ascertaining that the victim was his accomplice was frantic with despair he rushed into the dwelling and gazed around him anxiously the room appeared to his eyes just as it had a hundred times before kara was nowhere to be seen and the secret that tadros had plotted so artfully to discover was lost to him for ever confound you nephthys he cried returning to the archway you've killed the wrong man and eternally ruined my fortunes but the girl had disappeared in her mother's hut she had quietly seated herself at the loom and resumed her work at the shuttle end of chapter twenty five chapter twenty six of the last egyptian this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Last Egyptian by L. Frank Baum. Chapter 26. The Dragoman Wins. Antar, the Sheikh, waited for Kara until his patience was exhausted. Then he left the Dahabia and came up through the sands to Fedar to discover, if possible, what had delayed the prince from returning with his promised reward. To Antar this cluster of hovels seemed mean and unattractive when compared with his own village, and these hills were not likely places for treasure tombs. He knew that the French and Italian excavators had been all over them, and found only some crocodile mummy pits. The sheikh grew suddenly suspicious. Kara's promises were too extravagant to be genuine, Doubtless he had deceived Antar from the first, and sought to obtain his services without payment. It was true that Kara was reputed in Cairo to be wealthy, but he might easily have squandered his inheritance long ago. One thing Antar was certain of, the Egyptian prince must produce his treasure at once, or the sheikh, thinking he was duped, would undertake to exact a bit of vengeance on his own account. Thus musing, he turned the corner of the hill and came full upon Tadros, who was expecting him. The dragoman's thumbs were thrust into the pockets of his gorgeous silver and blue vest. He stood with his feet spread well apart, in an attitude of dejection. His countenance was sorrowful and discontented. Ah! growled the sheikh. This is the man Kara requested me to kill. I do not doubt it, returned Tadros meekly. It is so much easier to kill one than to pay him the wages he has earned. Does he owe you money? demanded Antar sharply. Yes, and now I shall never get it. Why not? Have you not heard? Prince Kara came to this village a few hours ago and was met by a captain of police who wants him in Cairo for more than a dozen crimes. What? Have you brought the police upon us? exclaimed Antar angrily. I? How absurd! I came here to get my money. But they have taken Kara south to meet a detachment of soldiers who are coming from Asyut. Presently they will return here in force to rescue Winston Bay, who is in some trouble through Kara's actions. You are lying to me, declared the sheikh. It is you who have set up the officers upon us. You are a traitor. Tadros appeared distressed. You have known me long, my sheikh, said he, and have always found me an honest man. 
Never have I mixed with the police in any way. But do you imagine the government will neglect to watch over Winston Bay and protect him from his enemies? Ask the captain when he returns with the soldiers and Kara. He will be here very soon now, and he will tell you that Tadros the dragoman had nothing to do with his coming here. The sheik glanced around nervously. You say he will be here soon? At any moment. Something has gone wrong with Winston Bay's Dahabea, it seems, and the soldiers are to put things right. Antar fell into the trap. In common with most natives, he greatly feared the mounted police, and had no inclination to face a company of them. Quickly he ran to the end of the hill overlooking the river, and blew a shrill blast between his fingers as a signal to his comrades. Instantly his men swarmed from the distant boat and sped over the sands towards him. The sheikh met him, and the whole band turned toward the north, quickly disappearing among the rugged crags of the mountains. Tadros, convulsed with laughter at his easy victory, watched until the last Arab was out of sight. Then he walked down to the Dahabea, where, in the gathering twilight, he cut the bonds of the prisoners, assuring Winston Bay and his party, with many bombastic words, that he had vanquished their enemies, and they owed their lives to his shrewdness and valour. "'You are free as the air,' said he. "'Fear nothing hereafter, for I will now remain with you.' "'Where is Kara?' asked Winston. Tadros did not know, but he suspected that Consinor, before returning from the interior of the treasure chamber, had murdered the Egyptian, whose mysterious disappearance could in no other way be explained. Not wishing to mention the Viscount's name, whose murder might involve both Nephthys and himself in trouble, he stuck to his original lie. "'Kara is fleeing in one direction, and the Arabs in another,' he said pompously. "'I am too modest to relate how I have accomplished this remarkable feat, "'but you must admit I have been wonderfully clever and successful, "'and by remaining faithful to your interests have saved you from a terrible fate.' "'Winston did not answer, for he was just then engaged in holding Aneth in a close embrace, "'while Mrs. Everingham looked upon the happy pair with moist eyes and smiling lips.' But old Lord Roane felt that their rescuer merited more tangible acknowledgment of his services. "'You are a brave man, Tadros,' he said. "'I am indeed, sir,' agreed the dragoman earnestly. "'When we return to Cairo, I will see that you are properly rewarded.' Tadros smiled with pleasure. "'Thank you, my lord,' said he. "'It is no more than I deserve.' "'Just now,' continued his lordship, "'we are bound for Luxor to celebrate a wedding.' "'With Tadros for dragoman, remarked the Egyptian, calmly lighting a cigarette. "'All things are possible.'" End of chapter 26 End of The Last Egyptian by L. Frank Baum